Kant University, who's going to talk about rationality of geometrically rational three points. Well, thank you very much. <coughs> it's nice to be here. I had my first trip to CMSA. So let me start a little bit with the overall context. So what we, what we hope to achieve. So tomorrow I'm going to work over a field K. Um, and X is going to be a smooth projective three pole. Over our field, and we'll have a, a blanket assumption throughout. So we'll assume that when we pass to the alpha closure, we get something that's rational. <coughs> over K bar. So, in other words, the function field over K bar is. <coughs> Transcendental generated by three elements. So, <clears throat> so this is the situation that we're in. And so now, what we'd like to ask is, are there simple criteria for deciding? X is rational over the ground field. So can, can we sort of reduce the rationality of X over the ground field to things that are readily computable, Galois cohomology, straightforward invariance. This is a sort of a high level goal. And so let me give some, some easy necessary conditions. Uh, so probably the easiest necessary condition is that if it's going to be rational, then there have to be points. If there are no points over the ground field, then there's no way it can be rational. And so that's, that's probably the easiest and most workable condition. But there are other conditions. So, so, so let's suppose that in our field K, it means the many R. So then, the real points of R must be connected. So basically, the idea is that if you have a, a parameterization on the real projective plane, the X, since this is connected, this has to be connected. <clears throat> so, so there's some easy criteria that you can see in order to have rationality, but we'd really like to be able to give a complete, a complete characterization. Um, and so the kind of inputs that should go into this Well, certainly it should depend on the geometry. Oh, maybe I'll say the geometric structures on X. Over the algebraic closure. But it also should depend on some Galois type invariants. Galois cohomology or structures that show the interaction of the Galois group of our ground field with the geometric objects. So, so maybe I'll give an example of how this works. Oh, and most of the results I'll present today are joint with Yuri Chinko, and a few of them are joint with Alina Perutka. So let me show you what I consider sort of a satisfactory solution in a dimension two case. So in other words, we assume all these conditions with the one proviso of the X is two-dimensional over the field rather than three-dimensional. And so then, 
So in Reapers, Manin, and Miskowski, So they, they give a complete criteria for, for, for rationality. In terms of the Galois action. On the Picard group, from the algebraic closure, and the existence of points. And so I, I don't think I can hope to, to summarize this whole theory, but maybe I'll give you an example, the kind of result that they, <coughs> that they give. That's sort of part of this picture. So this is kind of a sample. Um, so let's say that X is a, a pencil surface. And by this, I just mean that the canonical class, which is the first trend class of the dancing bundle, but this is possible. <clears throat> so suppose we have a dental surface of degree at most four. So then, <clears throat> in fact, it's minimal. That is, if there is no minus one curve or union of minus one curves to find over the ground field, then X is not rational. And so results like this are basically, I mean, this is like a good solution to the problem because I've reduced it to Galois theory in some sense. That is, I basically decide <laughs> if I know how the Galois group is acting on invariance of X, I basically solve it. Yeah, I mean, X K bar is minimal? No, 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 no. I mean, X is minimal over the ground field. Meaning? Ah, so what I mean by this is that there are no cycles of pairwise disjoint Minus one curves to find over k. So you you, you can't. So you imagine if you have a, a cycle of you know, k minus one curves that are Galois conjugated over the ground field. If I wall these down, I can get a simpler Del Pencil surface, and often I can use this to get an explicit birational parameterization. That answer the question. Okay. So, so this is sort of the prototype that we reduce the, this rationality question to something that we can analyze through Galois theory. All right. So, so this is kind of the big picture. Are there any questions before I drill down a little bit and look at the specific examples? So if it's bigger than five, they're all rational. I'm sorry. I, I, if it's I, bigger I, than five, this the if, case. Yeah. So if a, it's a it's a it's a true theorem that if you have a Delpenthal surface of degree five, it's always rational. If it's degree six, it's rational. If you have a point over the ground field, degree seven is always rational. I mean, there's you need a point. 
then it's rational. So maybe I'll just state this as I. But as Lundo pointed out, no, no, I, this is just Koski. I get nothing to do. Oh, I <laughs> so no. So <coughs> if the degree is greater than five, then it's always rational, <coughs> provided. Criterion for whether they're rational points is also essentially a Galois, a Galois theoretic criterion. I'm guessing this is the type of result you are after. This is the kind of thing that, 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 I, that I'm after. And so one thing I should mention is that Kuznetsov has a general program Rationality of <coughs> final three faults, <laughs> which you say prime final three faults of index one. And so he has a very precise description of which one should be rational, which one should be not rational. I mean, of course, the ones that are not rational with the complex numbers, you know they're not rational. But um, it has a very explicit description in terms of derived categories, and I, I'm not going to do derived categories in this lecture, but there's a bigger picture of, how, uh, of, ge of geometric invariance and how you construct them to control this question. Okay. Are there any other questions? Absolutely. I, I yeah. don't understand this Kuznetsov. So... I'm not going to sort of give his talk, but essentially he looked at the bounded derived category. But this is over any field? Oh, over any field. And either there's some twisting data that you can extract out of it or not, and that determines the rationality. But I'm going to I'm gonna use my own formula. Okay, okay. I just wanted to mention that there, there's sort of a bigger picture that for how, how this should all fit together, and I'm doing a little part of that picture. So let me turn to a classical construction. <coughs> so at a high level, <coughs> um, so there's only a few constructions. So the hope is that there's only a few constructions that will show that something is rational. And then you show that these are the only things that can possibly work. And so, at the risk of abusing people's patience, I'm going to show you the key construction that, that proves a lot of the cases. And then I'll prove theorems to say that this is kind of the only thing that can work in certain situations. All right, so, let's, so now I'm going to assume that we're working over a field that has characteristic not two. And I want x to be a complete intersection Uh, quadrupector surfaces. So let me wear what we feel when I mean by that. <coughs> so X is given by some quadric equations. <coughs> In PN, where these are all Forms. <clears throat> and so I have R forms that I'm working in, in PM. So this is the basic setup, and I'm always going to assume that these are smooth. So this is just a, a smooth subvariety of co-dimension R that's cut out by quadrants. And so there's a very simple fact. That I, I want to emphasize. So we can, if we look at projection from, let's suppose that there exists a plane. So P 
r minus 1 in x. So an r minus 1 dimensional subspace, linear subspace. So then the construction So projection time. from the subspace. So the projection map gives you a map from X to PN minus R. It factors through the blow up. Projection is birational. So, <clears throat> so whenever I project from a plane where the it's key, of course, that the dimension here is, reflects the number of quadrics in the intersection. But under this condition, I get a birational map, and this is sort of the basic building block that we're going to use to prove birational triviality. Um, so, so what shall I say? So, I mean, for example, this, in the case where r is equal to 1, this is saying that if you have a point on the quadric, it's rational for the ground floor. One of my favorite constructions. And so this is kind of the key building block. And so the, the question is, to what extent, so to what extent, Does this construction govern rationality? <coughs> Rhetorical question, not a research question. This is this is the thing. So we have this nice construction. It gives an explicit rational parameterization. To what extent does this control it? What's going on? And so let me start with actually some negative results. <laughs> so the first thing that results is let's say that we have x is sitting in G4. So I have n equals 4. I have r equals 2. So this is given by vanishing two quadrics. <coughs> and let's work over the reals. Okay. So I have a, uh, this is an example of a quartic del pixel surface. example would be where x is given by the blow up. All right. So let's let s be a sphere. So by a sphere, I mean a, a quadric that it has um, in P3, where you don't have rulings to find up the ground field. So it's literally a sphere, like in you know, top three. And so, Elixoid. So if I take a blow up of this along two pairs of conjugate points, so this is an example of something that doesn't have any lines over the ground field, but yet it's still rational. So, so <clears throat> in many cases, things can be rational without this being reasonable. So there's another negative result. So let's let x be in P7. 
So here I want n equals 7, r equals 3, k equals 7. <coughs> so I have a complete intersection of three quadrants. Uh, and so, so the ones containing So there's a co-dimension three condition that you get by insisting that there be a plane, but there's a lot more rational examples. So in other words, if you look at the moduli space, well, so the ones that contain a plane you get one codimensional <coughs> locus, but there's a there's a countable number of other loci. These are actually dense in moduli. That parameterize rational examples. So here is like this this is a situation where it's kind of messy, right? So here's a situation where there's, there's, more, there's Hobbes theory that's controlling it. Not just, <clears throat> this is not really just controlled by the alcohol homology. The Hobbes structures here seem to be controlled from rationality. Yeah, go on. Um, are all of these other <coughs> also co-dimension three? They're, they're all co-dimension three. Uh -huh. And they're, done, they're essentially defined by um, looking at cohomology classes mm -hmm. in the middle cohomology of X. And asking that the uh, given cohomology class um, with a parity condition mm -hmm. is a Hodge class. And, and that's the theorem. It's a complete classification of rational complete. Um, I'm not claiming that, that I'm not claiming that I know what all the rational examples are. Uh -huh. That is, there could be some dissident examples that don't fit into this. Some dissident examples right. that don't fit into this, this uh -huh. description. Mm -hmm. That is. <laughs> I have a construction that gives a countable number, but I don't claim that it's a complete list. Uh -huh. And in fact, there is no example of a smooth complex projective variety bearing a moduli where you can characterize the rational and irrational examples, except in cases where they're all rational or all irrational. <coughs> I'm not very good at telling these things apart when, when things are changing. But this, this is sort of like a, a negative example that there's just a lot of geometry. We're hoping that this isn't true for three folds. And we're hoping that there isn't this much complexity. But this is a dimension four? It's a fourfold example, yes. So fourfold, things get more complicated for fourfolds. So anyway, all right. So I'm going to, I think that's all I want to say about this. So are there any questions before I change directions again? So now, I'd like to focus on uh, 
a specific example. So in the nomenclature I set up before, this is the n equals 5 <coughs> over equals 2 example. So in other words, x and p5 is a complete intersection. state the theorem early on, and then I'll just do, in case people need to leave, or you know, I'll state the punchline, and then I'll go through and explain the, the geometric background. So, and here I'm working on the algebra. So this theorem is Basically, simultaneously, Trinkle and myself at Wittenberg. Um, so, uh, let me give us both credit. So, <coughs> so, X is rational over the field K. If and only if X admits a line. So, you assume smooth, right? I mean. Always smooth. If and only if there exists a line. If I so we get a complete characterization for rationality. That is, the only way these things can be rational is this is sort of the obvious construction you know, that Kuma would have come up with if you asked him. So, <coughs> So, so this is a basic result. Um, and so in particular, you don't have the complexity that I indicated in that it's higher dimensional examples. All right. So I would actually rephrase this in a, in a form that, that's more Galois homological than it looks now. Now it looks pretty geometrical. But in fact, this is going to be recast in, in the sort of a a more algebraic form, but let me state the geometric version first. So this is equivalent that the final surface has a point? So that's the yes, yeah. And so I'm about to sketch out all the, the basic geometry that goes into this. So, So let me summarize uh, the geometric structures. That okay. So let's see. So there's a couple of structures I should mention. So the first structure is so this is defined as a vanishing locus of two quadrants. And so there's a natural vibration. So I can just look at the total space of the pencil. And so that is a blow up of P5 along X, fibers of a P1, just given by just given in this form. So this is a pencil associated with this family. So it's just blowing up the base locus of the pencil quadrants. And this carries a structure of a quadrant vibration. This is a vibration in quadrant form. So, th so this is one of the key things I'd like to look at. Is there a question? All right. So let 
we call this Q. So this is a natural invariance associated with it. Now, I need to rely on some basic homogeneous space or linear algebra knowledge. So, so let's let over this, so let this be the, the relative variety of maximal isotropic subspace. So let me let me sort of like let me write a little cheat here. All right, so the fibers are basically isomorphic to <coughs> grassmannians. Right? Uh, Two-dimensional subspaces in P4. And so the maximum isotropic subspaces here, they correspond to uh, Lines in a in a codimension one subspace, or lines. Oh, incident. I mean, there's an explicit description of these maximum isotropic subspaces. So I think it the, the explicit description probably depends on where you're coming from. You probably each have our own explicit description, but I think whether you're a differential geometer, you've seen these things before. And so this relative variety of maximum isotropic subspaces. So this fibers over P one. So oh, it goes down to here. So we have a vibration. And so let's think about what the fibers look like. So the fibers of this map are disjoint unions, generally. So you just pick one of the two connected components of the maximal isotropic subspace. And so, so you, you, know, you get Basically, you know, this is reflecting the fact that you, if you think of this as lines in P3, you can take the lines to a point, or the lines in, this, in, a, in a plane, and they both are parameterized by P3. And so, if I take this induced map, the sign factorization, this is a sign factorization. Well now, here, this is a P3 bundle, and this is a 2 to 1 cup. So how do we interpret the 2 to 1 cover? Let me call it G. Well, G is branched. <coughs> over the locus, there the determinant of these vanishes with the, with the quadric strong break. So it branches <coughs> over six points. And so let me say something here. So a lot of the uh, stuff I'm going to do here I mean, <coughs> geometry, there's nothing original in this. I mean, well, some of it goes back to Coburg, but the relevant references I should mention here are Miles Reed and Jerry Long, who wrote Harvard thesis on this some years ago. So these are, these are two of the inputs that, that I'm uh, relying on here. So this is the first bit of So the key thing is that this curve of genus 2 is a fundamental invariant of the family. So this construction doesn't depend on any choices. It works over an arbitrary field. C is smooth as long as X is smooth. All right. So now, there's a couple things I get out of this. All right. So the first thing I want to look at is the comics contained in X. 
So I want to look at the, the, the plane conics that are contained in X. Now, these conics, let's think about how this works. So if I have a if I have an isotropic subspace, every isotropic subspace determines a conic in X, because I just take the isotropic subspace and see where it restricts. On the other hand, every conic determines an isotropic subspace. And so these conics are, in fact, isomorphic for this variety of isotropic subspaces for the vibration. And so they fiber over a curve C. And so this is a P3 bundle, as, as indicated before. So this is the first bit I want to describe. So this is the implications of this analysis. So the second thing I want to look at is the lines in X. I think I'll have to erase here. Now remember, our goal right, is to analyze whether this has a rational point. So let me tell you a little bit about the geometry. So geometrically, this is geometrically an abelian surface. So the lines contained in this container section, they're parameterized by an abelian surface. And then over the ground field, <coughs> this is a principal homogeneous space. Over the Jacobian of This is true over the ground. So the complex number is just the intermediate Jacobian of X. Uh, over the complex numbers, this is just the intermediate Jacobian, which is the Jacobian of C. All right. So let me. Um, <clears throat> so so I have this these lines, the geometric of the surface, and we get a principal homogeneous space. Okay. So I could say a little bit more about this principal homogeneous space. If I take the, the lines as a principal homogeneous space, and multiply it by 2, <coughs> this is actually equal to the degree of one line bundles on C. So this is the basic structure that we get. So let me try to explain why this should be the case, because it's maybe a little bit confusing. So I'm going to try to do a diagram that suggests this. Um, so here goes. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. So let's look at a symmetric square of the lines on X. Okay. So, <clears throat> so these are just unordered pairs of lines on X. Now, this condition here so tells me that I'm going, going to be able to map this to the degree one component of the card variety. This is a vibration in Coomer surfaces. can be embedded into this. So let's think about the geometry here. So here I have generally skew lines. Here I have conics. But they intersect <coughs> along the reducible conics. Where I have two lines that come together. So I'll write this as a degenerate conics. These are the singular conics. So this embeds into here. This is 
depends on the here. Then degenerate the conics also have fiber out to sea. And this is also a cumulative vibration. So, so this is a basic structure that I got. All right, so this is, this is kind of the machinery that's going to underlie everything. So this diagram basically explains the relationship. So maybe I'll write this here. So this diagram is a geometric reason why the class of the lines is equal to the degree one component of the Picard's game and, and uh, the principal homogeneous basis of the Jacobians. To so, clarify the geometric picture, isn't also true that you were over the complex number x is a blow up of p3 in a genus 2 curve and then blowing down the quadric path on which it lies? Yes, yes. So if I, I, if I, I probably should have taken five more minutes and said that when you project from a line, you get a map on the p3 and the inverse is given by the complete system of cubics vanishing along a degree 5 genus 2 curve. Um, of course, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know that a priori though. All right, so this is the basic setup. Yes. So is um, if you have a genus two curve uh, whose peak one uh, has sort of a square root in the uh, as a class in of torsors over the Jacobian, does it always come? I think place? it's. I think that I think it's a slightly more complicated. But but that's, there's a paper by Bargavar, Gross, and Long that completely describes when you can do this lifting process. And so they, they basically there's a sort of a generalized Jacobian that you have to introduce. But there's a long list. The Galois theory is well known, but I don't want to. But that's slightly more complicated than you might think. Are there any other questions? Before I erase all that geometry. I think I'm going to regret erasing all of this. Huh? All right, well, let me erase this as late as possible. All right, so now let's do the, the analysis of rational, rationality. So the, at a high level, the key ingredient is a version of the Clemens Griffiths method. Of intermediate Jacobian. So, um, so well, let, let me say it at this level first. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be more specific in a moment. And so, <clears throat> there's a recent paper of Benoit and Wittenberg. This is this is the, the ingredient that I want to use. All right, and so so let's say I have a diagram like this. So I have a rational map, a rational parameterization, and I factor it like this, where this is a blow up. Along smooth centers. 
So, I mean, if, at the risk of alienating Dan, let's assume we have strong factorization and it's a blow up on both sides, just to, to make things concrete. So, you know, blow up on one side, blow down on the other side. So, let's think about how the, <coughs> the trout groups vary as we do this. So, as we do these blow ups. So, sort of step by step, so if we blow it, if we blow up the curve, D is W, a free fall. So if I want to understand the chart group of codimension two cycles <coughs> of W, excuse me, of the blow up of W. <coughs> Roughly, this is just equal to the codimension two cycles that you start off with, plus the the Picard group of the center. <coughs> As you do these blowups, right? So I, I have the child groups that you start off with, and then I introduce the child groups of these things here, and so. Basically, these are equal to a direct sum of principal homogeneous spaces over the Jacobian of the. So, when I when I'm contributing each stage, is I have principal homogeneous spaces over the center of what I'm blowing up. sum of the intermediate Jacobian of W the Jacobian of C. So this is the intermediate Jacobian. And so the recent work of Benoit and Wittenberg and <coughs> Um, Kesselin and Martin, actor and Pial, allow you to do this over over non-closed field and make sense of these as principally polarized ability varieties. All right. So basically, if, when you have a diagram like this, what can I extract from it? Well, the punchline. So here I'm using the. <coughs> But the decomposition properties of uh, these principally polarized abelian varieties that I get from the construction. So the punchline is that if X is rational, So then, for some center, D, in this map, we call it beta, group so the, the components of the child group are of the form pick B of D. 
or or something like this. So in other words, you're going to be when you when you do this blowing up process, you're going to get a copy of a principal homogeneous space of D, the center, some center that came from the process. You know, I could have blown up 35 things and blown down 34 things, there may only be one center that survives. But using the this decomposition properties, I can identify what which factor is actually the factor that shows up in the intermediate Jacobian of, of X. And then for that curve, there's a principal homogeneous space over its Jacobian that gives you the result. Okay? It gives you the, the chart. All right. So what do we get? Well, there's one other thing I want to mention. So there's a trillion here. Now, if, if you remember, I had this curve C that I introduced at the outset. And so this curve C was the intrinsic curve that's defined over an arbitrary field from the, from the, from the, 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 the associated pencil. And so the trailer here tells you that, in fact, D and C are isomorphic over the round. <coughs> so if you just look at these Jacobians, look at the Galois actions, the strong version of the trailer here over non-closed field says that these are, these are the same under our assumptions. And so I want to emphasize that I... The, these curves C are genus two curves, and so there's no there's no opportunity for confusion that might occur if, 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 if they decompose into products of genus one curves. So now I get something strange. So so we, got, we if you remember we have the lines of X. So this is equal to so the lines of x is equal two times the lines of x is equal to pick one of c, right? But now, so doing this analysis here, we get that <coughs> two times this pick one of well d. Right? I mean, I can I can identify this and if it's a blow up with pick of E for D. So I get this relationship, but C and D are isomorphic to each other in the genus two. <clears throat> well, the only way that this could happen is that everything in sight These are equal to zero. As principal homogeneous spaces. Over the Jacobian of C. I mean the only way we can get this relation, this divisibility relation, is if they're if they're the same thing. Alright, well that means that well. That means that the lines of X, right, is equal to the Jacobian of C. And so this has a point. Over K. So this divisibility relationship that you get from the law parameterization gives a relation. And that forces the lines to have a point of the ground field. So I can do two things now. I can pause and give people a chance to interrogate me on what I just wrote. Or I can give examples of what this is saying over the real numbers. So this is actually a, kind of a nice theorem even over the real numbers. So Dan, you, you look like you have a question. I mean, uh, it seems to imply that that uh, two e minus one is uh, times pick one c is sorry 
it's, it seems to imply that the, that the classes are torsion rather than zero. I mean, am I missing something? Well, we know that the, we know that for genus two curve, pick E is only can be non-trivial in odd degrees, right? Okay. Sure. So okay. I, I okay. should have said. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So yeah. pick two of C. This always contains the class of the canonical. Right, right. And so this is equal to zero. As a principal homogeneous space. <coughs> over the Jacobian. So, I mean, it's, the fact that it's two torsion is, yeah. yeah. A priori, of course, as Wong shows, this is a priori four torsion. So the Wong's thesis shows that this is the four torsion element. If x admits a rational point, it's two torsion. And if it's rational, it's one torsion. So are there any? Well, then I think the only thing I'll, I'll just mention is, just as a comment, so this is new even over R. <coughs> so the, the rationality of complete intersections of two quadrics over R, as far as I knew, was an open question. Because there are, I mean, this is something that you could probably give your linear algebra classes. I mean, you can find examples of complete intersections of real quadratic forms in six variables. You know, there's lots of different isotopy types, you know, nine different isotopy types. Some of them are empty, some of them are disconnected, some of them are connected. You enumerate the ones that are connected. Of those that are connected, some have lines and some don't. You enumerate those. And there's some connected examples that don't have lines, and as far as I know, those connected examples that don't have lines, we didn't know whether they're rational or not before this. So I think even in the real case, this is something that's fun. And so we actually discovered this by working over the real case. So the, I, I prepared all the isotopy types, but I think I'm not going to try to write that down in the minute I have left. So let me stop there. Thank you. Okay, any questions? This Ludmil's question, what's the, what do you expect to be a more general picture? So the general picture that I expect is that you look at something that's geometrically rational, but you're trying to decide whether it's rational. And if it's geometrically rational, then geometrically it's blown up by, 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 in some curve. Over an angle spot ground field, it may not be, but you can still find a principal homogeneous space over the Jacobian of the curve. And so the, the point I would say is that if that, so if you have a principal homogeneous space over the Jacobian of a curve, if it actually comes from the child groups or points on the curve, there are constraints. For instance, <coughs> let's say that I'm in, um, I have a Fano threefold prime index one Fano threefold uh, degree 16. And so then I look at it and I get a genus three curve and a two torsion element. And so I can look at that and see whether that two torsion element and uh, whether that actually is represented by pick E for the curve. It either is or it's not. So I think that that, that seems to be the mechanism. It's slightly different than what Kuznetsov is proposing, which is more derived categorical. You know, he's looking at elements in Brouwer groups rather than elements in these uh, Bay Chatelet groups. Um, but maybe there, I mean, there's certainly a relation between them. So my understanding is that they're very rarely ra rational. But they're very rarely rational? You mean, um, or there are very few fields for which this is uh, going to be rational. I mean, of course, it depends on what what rare means. So if you're working over R, it, it's on the surface will rarely have a point over 
What well, field are you working over? I mean, so, I mean, if you're working over R, right, then there's an isotopy connect decomposition. And so someone that's a better differential geometer than I could, could compute the probability with respect to natural <laughs> metrics of being on each one of these nine components. I think this is actually kind of a fun problem. You know, there's some probability distribution, you know, with respect to... Uh, uh, but that's <coughs> I meant for all three-dimensional patterns. I mean, so if you just look at the funnel surface, and so you consider this over some fields, I think that uh, the funnel surface will rarely have a point. But well, it always has a point over a finite field. Oh, these completers, it always has a point over a finite field, right? So I should have mentioned that. Completer sections are two quadrics in P5 over a finite fields. They always have rational. They're always rational because of the Lange's theorem. So, I mean, it's... Because of which theorem? Lange's theorem, uh -huh. a principal homogeneous space over a billion variety on the finite field. Mm -hmm. That's a point. So yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I think it, it depends on what fields you're working on. Right, there's lots of fields, and you know, they have different statistical properties. So generally, over local fields, real fields, finite fields, I think it's not so hard. Over global fields, it's going to be a lot harder. I mean, in this dichotomy, it's one thing that there's this paper by Varga, by Gross, and Wong, where they show that most genus two curves have no points, even though there's no local obstructions. And th that theorem, you know, runs on the same kind of machine theory. And you're playing off the different conditions with these final variety of lines as you go from local fields to global fields. So I think it really depends on the field. Any other questions? So I don't understand any how, Kuzne, uh, how Kuznetsov's approach actually can be connected with this. How it can what? Can be connected to this. So. The only thing I would say is that he gets a Brouwer class. But over Brouwer the group of categories? No, he gets a Brouwer, Brouwer class, he gets a twisted version of the curve. So his assertion would be, using homological projected duality, that the derived category in a final threefold, the geometrically ra rational final threefold, is equivalent to the twisted derived category over a certain curve associated with the final threefold, where the twisting is an element of the Brouwer group. And you, then you look at the element of the Brouwer group as a trivial or not over the ground field. I'm not, you probably, you understand homological protective duality better than I do, I think. But that's the basic structure that I think he's pushing forward. It's related, but, but the, there's a, you know, the, the connection between the Brouwer group and the principal homogeneous basis is sometimes a little bit subtle. It, at least it confuses me sometimes. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks. Next talk is at 10.30, then it gets there. Thanks, you in a few days.